Hey everyone, this is Carolise, and today's video we're continuing on the series of business requirements. This video is going to be very important because we're talking about what makes a good business requirement. What are the tips for writing good business requirements? That's going to be awesome. Don't go anywhere. I will be right back. So we're continuing on the topic of business requirements, right? And I've already done a few videos so far in the series on business requirements. And the first one I did was, what is a business requirement? You can see that video here. And that really talks about what's the definition of a business requirement, what does it do? You know, what what what's the purpose of it, really? <laughs> and that video is a very short video, so go check that out. And then I did a video on business requirements and waterfall so that video is here and that video was to talk about is the business requirement the same as waterfall because you know so many people once they hear requirements they think waterfall and then they go crazy and like, oh no i mean you know i'm in agile i don't need to know this but is it the same is business requirement the same as waterfall and i answer that in that video and then i did another video on business requirements and business rules now that video is also very important because i go through examples of business rules and how you can incorporate the business rule into the business requirement. And then I did another video on business requirements and use case diagrams, right? So as we get more into waterfall, as we get into business requirements document, we talk about the business requirements document and the use case document and how they're similar or what is it that's in, involved in both of them. And in that video on business requirements and use case documents, I talked about an example of a use case document and gave you some of the, the the format, the template and so on. So you can go check that video out as well. And that brings you to this, this video, which talks about, you know, what makes a good <laughs> business requirement? You know, what are the things that you should be looking out for? How do you write these things? I'm going to be talking about that in a minute. So let me bring up my presentation. So tips for writing business requirements, right? So business requirements must be all of these things. It must be complete. So the requirement must contain all the information necessary to allow the project team to fulfill the requirement. It must be accurate. The requirement must be correct. Validation is generally done through reviews with stakeholders. An accurate requirement cannot be in conflict with another requirement. So the reason why we do so much you know stakeholder interviews so much you know conversation and iterations that we do our requirements analysis is because we have to make sure we get it right right and we only can know if it's right if we validate that with the actual people who know more about it than we do so we have to go back to the stakeholders we have to you know show them what we've come up with get their agreement get their buy-in to make sure that as we go along with creating these requirements, it's always going to be meeting the needs of these stakeholders. So it's a very iterative process. It's coming up with your design and your requirements and your flows and all that stuff, going back and checking the, 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 the stakeholder to make sure it's correct. And you add more to it, then you go back and check. And every time you change something, you got to go check. I mean, this is the world we live in. We have to check because you want to make sure that you're not assuming things. You want to make sure you're not coming up with things that are not correct. You want to make sure that the stakeholder is involved in each step of this process so that they can verify, they can bet because they have the knowledge, they have it, you don't. So you have to find a way using your analysis skills to draw out these things out of them, to ask the right questions, to probe, and to make sure that they, they understand what you're trying to do. And they're also invested in it too. It's not like you're going to be off by yourself. They want this process to be good. They want this system, they want this product to be successful too, <laughs> because it's gonna be benefiting them. It's gonna help them do their jobs better. It's gonna help them get you know better service in, in case of customers or you know, you know, B2C companies. So there is interest on both sides. You wanna do a good job as a business analyst, they wanna receive a good process, service, or product. So, you know, there is so much interest in both sides that you actually can come up with these things quite easily, you just need to make sure that as you make assumptions or as you make changes, you validate and bet with them. And it's, 
it sounds like a lot but it's really it's not that bad <laughs> it's not that bad right your requirements must be testable it means that you have to be able to verify it somehow it must be able to demonstrate it you can't just create a requirement that's like a back-end service to some system that the, the end user doesn't see any benefit from even if it's a back-end process it has to result in something that can be tested something that can be shown something that can be demonstrated because it has to benefit the user even if it's a back-end process right we could do a whole new video on just how to do that your business requirement has to be feasible so the requirement can be implemented there is no technical or other impediment that made the requirements undoable so you can have a requirement that cannot be done <laughs> you can have a requirement that there's technical challenges and you know the technology you're using or whatever technically just can't 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 be realized therefore you got to get rid of that requirement if it cannot be done technically you have to get rid of that requirement or you find another way but the requirement if it's in your requirements document and it has to be done it must be feasible to do you can't have a requirement that's going to take five years to get done when the project is only a year long right you can't have a requirement that's going to require you to uproot the entire system just to get this one thing done that nobody's going to agree to do that <laughs> right so you have to do things that are feasible possible plausible achievable within the time frame that you're trying to get this project done your requirement must be necessary right the requirement must describe a feature that the stakeholder actually needs it must relate to a business objective so don't just put fluff in your requirements document nice to have over here all these things that can create bells and whistles it must be needed it must be something that the stakeholder actually would benefit from that they would need to get their jobs done you know so we talked about jobs to be done in one of my other videos i think it's right here you can go check that out we talk about how to get to the user's journey to understand their jobs to be done so this is going back to be necessary right when you understand the user's journey where there ebbs and flows and you can see where in this journey can my process my system my service my product actually have value then you can create requirements around that but don't just create requirements for the sake of it don't just put in a bunch of fluff don't just put in a bunch of nice to have i always warn people about scope creep scope creep is a very real problem i have another video <laughs> here that talks about scope creep and how to avoid it right so listen to me i'm telling you because i have experience in this thing so put things that are necessary in your requirements document right and try to prioritize it to the most important things first and don't put extra um nice to have in there because that's going to cause scope creep it's going to cause budget overruns it's going to cause a lot of problems and really especially if you're coming to market with a new product a new service a new offering and again i have another video that talks about how to design a new process i'm laughing because i realize i've done videos of each of the steps along the way and i'm just pointing you to them so that you can also get that information in depth for each of those videos so in that video i talked about how to design a new process and that includes you know being able to um to uncover what people really need and so you can put that in there i talked also about you know the mvp what is the minimum viable product so that you build for example a skateboard first get to market with your skateboard and once that skateboard is in the market, you can add on windows, add a bigger wheel, add on a windshield, add a shell. Next thing you know, you have a car and the car is really great. But your users, your customers maybe only needed to move. And if you give them a skateboard, they would have been happy. But you could have spent a whole long time building a car and by the time you get to market, so many other people have cars anyway, the competition is way up the roof or nobody even wants a car. They just wanted to move quickly with a skateboard and you give them a car. Now it's all complicated. They got to do all these things and drive and foot and hands moving. And all they could have done is just glide along on their skateboard. Right? Because sometimes you might be overthinking over too much features. <laughs> it's also a problem. So just, I'm just going to get off my soapbox on that. But please build what is necessary first. Okay? Now, don't be ambiguous. 
your requirements have to be unambiguous. It has to be clear. It has to be concise. It has to be succinct. The requirement must be described in a simple and concise manner that guarantees that there are no differing interpretations of what the requirement means. So you don't want to have requirements where it's like, I thought what she meant was this, and I thought that's what she meant, because you know what? Sometimes when they work with developers, they don't always come back to you to clarify. They read your requirements, they understand one thing, they go off and build it. When they come back to demo it to you, like, that's not what I, what I meant. And then because you're in a waterfall environment, you may not see that demo for months and months, <laughs> right? So they could have gone off and spent time and money and energy building something over the course of months that's completely the wrong thing and gone completely off the rails. And this is why waterfall projects tend to go over budget and take longer than expected and just have a lot of problems because if the requirements are not clear, you could people could be communicating and thinking that they're understanding each other, but they're actually doing two separate things. And what you said it doesn't match what you built and then it's just craziness. Okay, so please don't be ambiguous. I'm going to give you examples of how to avoid ambiguity in a few minutes, right? And then your requirements have to be prioritized. So you need to make sure you put the most important things first, right? That This is more like just your list of requirements, not necessarily within the same requirement. It's more like once you have all of your requirements done, you prioritize them based on dependencies and other things, but mainly based on what's the most important thing, okay? Now here are some examples of good and bad requirements, right? So the first thing we talk about when we talk about what makes a good requirement is it must be atomic. Atomic, atomic, what does that mean? It means that each individual requirement refers to one and only one thing. So you only have one thing in that requirement. So it's very, very um, specific. And it's also very, very, you know, pointed and focused. And there is no, well, no ambiguity for one, but also it gives it one thing at a time. So the user must, here's an example. The user must be able to enter username and password to log in. That's very clear to understand, right? But that's a great way to write a requirement. But the other one could say the user must be able to enter username and password to log in. User can select forgotten password to get an email to change the password. It seems reasonable, doesn't it? But what happens if the developer has a problem with the forgotten password, but he's fine with the login? Now the whole requirement is being held up because he couldn't do a piece of it, because you convoluted it, because you put two things together that needs to be separated. It really needs to be two requirements. The user must be able to enter username and password to log in. That's one. And then the second one is the user must be able to click on the forgotten password so they can get an email to change their password two different things. Don't join things together, especially when you see people using a lot of conjunctions and stuff like that. Don't 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 join that. We also don't want a lot of adjectives. We don't want to go off in all this description. Make it concise, make it specific, make it detailed because that's going to help the developers to quickly scan through all of your requirements to come up with, you know, estimates of man hours or story points or whatever. I don't know how your team or your company does estimations, but they want to be able to read it, understand it really quickly. The more you put things together, you have no idea how much dependencies there are in the actual coding of the system. So you want to make them very isolated so people can code one thing and be done with it without having to wait on something else because it's dependent. Okay, so that's why we need to make each thing, you know, with each requirement refer to one and only one thing, it needs to be atomic, okay? The other thing that you need to be careful of is each requirement must be complete. So the requirement includes all the details needed to fully constrain it. So for example, the daily sales report will be emailed to a distribution list named sales report subscribers. That has all the details you need. It goes into an email, this is the name of the emailing list, etc. But if you wrote a requirement that said the sales report would be emailed daily, to who? <laughs> who gonna get it? It's not complete. It doesn't tell you enough for you to be able to properly complete the requirement. You get, you get what I'm saying? 
So you need to make sure you, you're not going to try to stuff every detail in there. Like you don't have to go into the details of what a distribution list means, because at this point in the requirements, you could probably safely assume that you would have had prior requirements explaining what a distribution list is and how to get to one. So you can refer to it later on, but you need to actually say which distribution list this is going to, especially in a system where you could have several, you know, emailing groups. You need to say where it's going. So that second example is one that's not complete, right? It's not complete. Now your requirements must be unambiguous. We talked about that just now, but requirements must not be open to interpretation. It has to be so clear that everybody who reads it should walk away with the same understanding. So let's look at this example. So the opportunity size field in Salesforce system must match the value and currency of the deal size field in Salesforce CRM. So that's very clear, right? That there's an opportunity size field in this system called Sales Pro, and there's this deal size field in this system called Salesforce CRM. And the value and the currency must match in both systems. Okay, that's fine. Um, we could even get into more detail to say that when you click save on the opportunity side, it must push to the deal side in CRM. And we could get into more detail, but I'm just trying to give you a, you know, a general <laughs> example. But this is very specific. That's the point. It's not ambiguous. You know where it's, where the data is coming from, and the fact that they both should be saying the same things, right? And this field must say this, and this field must say this. But then here's this one that says. The opportunity size must be consistent across systems. Now, if I have a requirement that says opportunity size must be consistent across systems, what does that mean exactly? Like I could walk away and think that, oh, consistent means that they have the same data type. They're consistent, you know, they're both kinds of fields, you know, <laughs> that's it. Doesn't mean that the value have to be the same. Or I could say consistent means that they have the same length. Or I could say consistent means that you know, they both have a, a, a value. It doesn't mean the value has to be the same. So there's a lot of ways I could reinterpret what consistent means. And so you want to keep away from those kind of things because it's going to mean that the developer could read this and interpret something else and you intended something else. He goes off and builds something you didn't intend and now you end up with something that doesn't match your intention and then money is being spent and time is being wasted and it's just a, it's a crazy mess to go correct it. So make your requirements unambiguous very clear it needs to be very clear okay now consistency this goes back to what we just talked about the whole thing is really about consistency but you know consistency in this sense means that each requirement doesn't conflict with the other requirements so because you would have done all of your ups upfront elicitation you talked to your stakeholders you had these buying sessions where you showed them what you're planning to do and they give you feedback and you refine get buying again refine you're doing that iterative process so that would help you to avoid situations like these where one requirement cancels out the other one or causes some conflict. So let's look at this example. In the first example, it says applications over 30 days must be marked as overdue. And then there's another requirement that says when an application becomes overdue, it will automatically generate a notification email to the processor. Now, in that example, I think they're both okay because you know when an application becomes overdue, you know, over 30 days, and you know it's going to automatically send an email to the processor of that application, which should be fine. But look at the second example. It says the system will automatically generate email notifications to the processor when an application is overdue. And the second one says the processor will be able to select if they will receive notifications for overdue applications. Two problems there. Did you see it? Can you tell me what it is? I wish I could hear you. <laughs> so I'll tell you. I think you already got it, but I'll tell you. So in the first case, we don't know what overdue means. What does overdue mean? Overdue could be the next day. In, you know, in, in mortgage applications, overdue could be you know many days. So you need to clarify what overdue means. But let's say that they, they already clarified that somewhere else. Even that was clarified in the first line, we're saying that we will automatically send an email. But in the second one, we're saying that the processor will choose if they will receive the email or not. So you haven't really clarified that because it feels like if you're sending an email automatically, then the user shouldn't be choosing to get the email. 
or if you're gonna do both there has to be something else in the middle but it, it feels like it cancels each other out because i am automatically pushing this email to you in the other sense you're saying that the user is making the choice if they will get it or not that's the conflict right that's not consistent right so you have to be careful that you don't create these kind of inconsistencies in your requirements because you have to think through the processes very well now verifiable so your your requirements must be verifiable right so each requirement is testable it's demonstrable and it's measurable okay so here's an example this system will take no more than five seconds to load that's very verifiable that's very testable you can demonstrate that very good but if you said the system will load pages quickly what does quickly mean like i could i could be loading the page stop you know write a few notes in my book and be like oh looked up it's loading oh that's great it's quick i didn't even realize i was writing notes for like five five minutes <laughs> you know i'm just saying but quickly could be interpreted in different ways so that's why you don't want to use words like that in your requirements it's too open to interpretation it's, it's not verifiable you know if i were to run a test on this i could pass it to say it, it was quickly to me the test passed but really that's not what you meant you know it's not measurable enough you can't use those kind of generic words in your requirements quickly often soon um those are not words that you you want to use all right, so the, the requirement must be technology independent. Now, this is a big one. So each requirement is independent of the technology used to implement it. It does not place constraints that favor one technology over another. Right? So you don't want to get into the position where as a business analyst, you are dictating technology to the development team as to what exactly they need to use to build this requirement. That's not for you. Okay? The development team has the skill, they have the knowledge, they have the expertise to determine how to implement what you come up with. So your requirement is your what and your why's. But how you actually get it done is up to the development team. Don't go over there, don't, don't stretch yourself over there, <laughs> right? It's not your place, really. And the reason why I'm saying this with such uh, emotion is because when you get into dictating specifications of systems you get into a very very crazy place that you may not be able to come out from under right because if you get them used to you telling them exactly which you know which technology stack to use and all that stuff they're going to expect it all the time and you don't have the skill to get to do that you're not a programmer or if you even were a programmer in your previous life this role doesn't require you to have that technical knowledge so don't get into that even if you know it don't get into that because you end up creating this expectation that you may not be able to always fulfill and you end up feeling um, inadequate eventually or you know you might offend people because they have the skills and they don't want to be dictated to they don't want you to tell them every little man detail of everything you need to be responsible for the business requirements what needs to get done and why and leave the development team to come up with how so here's an example of why uh, you know of how to not do this or an example of a good business requirement that focuses on the business need and the what's and the why and one that's a bad one which focuses on technology dependency so the quadrant chart must be responsive to different screen sizes and allow the user to use uh on desktop tablets and phones we probably could clean it up a little bit it might be allow the user to use this uh quadrant chart on desktop tablets and phones that's an okay requirement that's, that's good but if you say the quadrant chart must use the html5 javascript library joint js to handle responsiveness what like why are you getting into html5 and javascript specific library and all of it it's too much it's too much technical jargon that you don't need to be talking to because the, the, the end customer has no need to know this. That the end customer doesn't care if you use JS or something else. They want to know what the end result is, which is that they can use this software, this website, this app on their tablet or desktop, their phones. You know, so they want to know they can use this product in whatever device they so choose. You don't have to specify that the development team needs to use HTML5 uh, JavaScript library, right? That's 
way too much technology dependency and it gets you into the sticky place that's hard to come out from under. Okay, that, just avoid it, people. All right, so business requirement consents. Each requirement is free of extraneous information and wordage, such as adjectives that are not actionable. So don't add in all this fluff. Don't let your requirement be this paragraph with all this fluff and all this words because nobody's going to read it. Nobody's looking at a requirements document to read for fun. Nobody's like, wow, what a wonderful document. Let me just read it because I love to read, you know, prose. No, people are looking at it because they have to do their jobs and they want to understand what you need them to do. The people are going to read it. Your audience is going to be developers, other business analysts, project team members, etc. Sometimes even your support people will read your requirements document, your training, people will read your, your requirements document. So you want to just make it very specific, very much to the point. There's no need to argue for your requirement in this document. You've already done the argument already because you'd have had the stakeholder presentations, you'd have talked to all of these different groups, you've already heard the arguments, you've already talked to the development team, you've walked them through the, the process already. So here is just do this, do this, do this, <laughs> right? This is what we need, this is what we need, this is what we need. We don't need to be arguing for each of them. So in this example, the customer must be able to do a type ahead search so that as they are typing each letter, the system will present the products that match layers entered in the search. Now, I would say two lines the most for your requirements, for each of your requirements. Sometimes you can get into three lines, but you really don't want to be everything a three line uh, thing. You want it to be one line <laughs> as much as possible. If you really have to explain something, two lines, okay. But don't get into the habit of getting over that because it becomes too wordy and it means you need to break up your requirements. Nobody wants to read paragraphs and paragraphs and paragraphs, it's too much. So this example, which I say the bad example is, the customer must be able to do a relevant search and filter on the product catalog. And as they type in the search box, the system will filter the options it shows them so that they can have better choices and can clearly see if they like the product before they buy it. This will provide value for a better customer experience. It's way too much. Like you don't need to argue for why it's a good requirement. You don't need to argue that it's going to make the customer experience better and they're going to see the product before they choose it. All of that argument, all of that reasoning is assumed that you've already done that before you got here. So this is just, we need to do the search. We need to add a filter. We need to, you know, we need to allow them to create an account. We need to give them, you know, whatever, but it doesn't need to be persuasive, right? You don't need to persuade anyone at this point. All right, so how do you write your requirements document? You typically write them in your Microsoft product. Um, you know, they're normally very simple narrative statements where, you know, like I said, one-liners. And you could have your requirements document, your business requirements document be a combination of these specific, you know, individual requirements. You could add your use case document. As I told you, I did a video on the use case um, and the business requirement document, so you can watch that. And then you usually document it in Word. Some people like to use Excel because you can, you know, do traceability and all that stuff on it. Um, go and download my free template. I have a free template up there on carlis.com. Just go to the website, go to templates, look for the download and look for business requirements document, download it, go use it. I have no problem with you doing that. Watch my video on the BRD. I already put the link somewhere here already. But if you're into heavy waterfall, there's this, this software called Rational Rolls which is more of a legacy software, but people still use it for heavy documentation. A lot of people use Jira Confluence. You now we're used to Jira with Agile, but there's also the Confluence product, which also helps us to actually write requirements. But the most common thing is just to write it in Word. It's the most common thing, and some people like to use Excel, so that's okay. Now, the last thing I wanna say before I leave is about the requirements traceability. So, what is traceability? It's, this means very frank that the requirement was implemented, right? So because you're in a waterfall environment, you could have had all of these requirements and you have this big goal and all these requirements, you want to be able to trace each of these requirements back to the original goal to make sure that you're actually focused on the right thing. Uh, and so that's where the, tra the traceability comes from. So 
Normally, the business analyst would create this traceability matrix to see where each requirement fits and the test cases that match each requirements and all that stuff. Um, and if you're using um, software tools to do this, some people do it in just Excel, but if you're using software to HP ALM is very popular for this. So for example, one of the reasons why the traceability is that different requirements for data processes, user interface changes may, might relate to, for example, capture customer contacts as an objective. So you have this big objective to capture customer contacts, but you have UI elements that do that. You have different functionalities all around the place. So you want to make sure all of that is traced back to this main goal, this main functionality. And so you can see what are all the spin-offs that was done to accomplish that. So this is just kind of a thing that happens a lot on uh, waterfall. When you do Agile, I think the, the Kanban system kind of helps you to do that anyway. So you don't really need to have the traceability matrix in the Agile environment. Okay. So there you have it guys, how to write good business requirements. So that my tips on writing good business requirements. I really hope it was useful for you. And just to give you a little warning, what to look out for as you're writing your business requirements. The first thing to look out for is scope creep. Scope creep is real. It's no job, right? So scope creep will happen to you. It happens to a lot of projects that you want to because you're doing all this documentation up front and they're going out to build all this stuff before you even see it. And when you get it, you might not like what you get, right? So that's one thing. But the scope part of it really is that you could find that as you're building, there's new ideas and new things come up and you're adding this thing and you're adding that thing and that adds on and that adds on. Next thing you know, you're way on a budget, way over you know, time, like everything is exploding because each thing that you add takes time and effort and resources to code and to vet and to test. Right? So it sounds like a great idea until you actually put it in there and now it's exploding everything. So be careful, be careful, be careful. I can't stress this enough. Be careful of scope creep. The other thing I would say to you is to keep the user in focus at all times, right? So, you know, hopefully by now when you get to writing your requirements, you actually already did your user, you know, you know who your ideal user is. You did your user persona, you did your user journey map and you have an idea of who you're targeting. I would suggest that you print this persona out with all the attributes of the persona. I did a video on user personas and user journey maps. Please go check that out, <laughs> right? So when you know who your personas are, then you print that out. And as you're writing your requirements, you look at your persona and say, Sarah, would you actually want to do this feature? Would you actually use this? And try to keep that in mind. Like, Be very intimate with your, your ideal users know your ideal users perfectly and make sure you build specifically for them your secondary users and so on you can you can add things here and there but you want to make sure you make at least your ideal users very happy right so keep your users in focus would be the next thing i would say to do the other thing i want to caution you on is interdependencies to make sure you identify what depends on what so you can make your you know you're going to make your requirements atomic anyways if each thing is only one thing but when you're prioritizing them, it's great to know what depends on what. And sometimes you have to talk to the development team to find that out. So you can prioritize them in such a way that they can be done, you know, in the best, most efficient way possible. Um, yeah, so those are my tips on, you know, writing good requirements. I really hope this is useful for somebody. If you found it useful, there is no way I can know. There's literally no way. You literally have to subscribe. You have to leave a comment. You have to share the video. You have to take an action. How, will, how else will I know? Like I'm, I'm all the way here at ladder. I don't know where you are, but interact with the video <laughs> so I can know that you know people actually like it. So that's a small thing that you can do. So please go ahead and do that. Subscribe. Check out my blog, Carlis.com. I have some great templates up there that could be helpful for you. And you know, I post my latest video up there as well, so you can check it out that way too. So thank you again for watching. I hope this is useful and I will see you next time. Take care.